Hey, welcome to Mark Hummel's Harmonica Party. Here with Jeff Vargin, and we're talking about questions that you might have about uh, the programs that we're doing. Yeah, Mark, I'm here behind the camera, and uh, congratulations on your tours, recent tours. And we've had lots of questions come in from our fans out there, and they're submitting them by email. Our email you'll see is right on the screen right now. We're happy to answer any questions we can. First question comes about bands. Um, the person says, you front many different bands and groups, the Blues Survivors, the Basement Shakers, Little Walter and James Cotton tribute shows, the Flashbacks, the, Go the Golden State Lone Star Review, and the Harmonica Blowout Tour Band. How do you decide which band will play on which tour or gig? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, the, the, the deep basement thing, I've kind of let that go, to tell you the truth. But all the rest of them, a lot of it just kind of depends on the event that we're doing. It depends on the tour that I'm doing, who I've had out recently, who I haven't had out in a while. Uh, this year, I'm primarily working with Anson Funderburg. And it was, it was more, the reasoning was that Junior Watson, who was booked on a lot of this stuff, became more and more unavailable with just personal things going on. And so Anson is pretty much doing the entire year. Here's another question that sort of follows up on that kind of idea. It says, the person says, um, I've always wondered how musicians put tours together. How do you begin to plan a tour? What's a kind of a chicken or the egg thing? Okay, uh, that's a good question. Um, a lot of times when I tour, you need an anchor date to start. And an anchor date is at like a festival that's paying more money to basically bank roll the tour. So you have to have that in advance. Um, there's times that I've just started tours just because, you know, I got maybe this, this uh, number of dates, like say like a four date rundown in Southern California, like I'm doing. That kind of was the predecessor to booking the rest of the dates in the South you know, southwest and southeast. So that would be like, because you're already in Southern California, yeah. you might as well continue well, on. Let's just continue on. And, and, and I mean, you know, the other thing is nowadays, a lot of times I'll kind of book a tour according to, well, I got to put some miles on the van to write off miles at the end of the okay. year. I mean, you know, so, there's, a, there's a lot of things that come into it. But primarily what I've done over the, like, say the last year and a half, I mean, if I look back on it, uh, I've done tours with, say, Junior Watson, you know, then I might do a tour with, with somebody like Anson Funderburg, then I might do a James Cotton tribute tour. And, I, and I'm kind of going according to what I'm thinking that people want in terms of festivals and that sort of thing. Um, and the, this dovetails to this other question. There, I sort of categorize these questions into, you know, when I got them in, I put them into categories. And this is more on the tours. How do you plan which cities you will play and what venues. And you said a little bit about anchoring with a city, but when you're just gonna decide, I wanna go on a tour, how do you know what cities and venues? Are they from things you've done before? Well, yeah, most of it is, I mean, considering I've got 39 years of touring in me that I've done, I kind of know where a lot of the hot spots are that I have more popularity. Uh, so a lot of times I follow things according to, you know, where I've been before that we have a good following. Uh, you know, the other thing is I, I, I kind of like to try to return to a lot of areas that I did, say, the year before. And so, like, I mean, this next tour, I hadn't been in the Southwest for a long time. It had been a really long time. So I'd done Los Angeles, but I really hadn't done things in, say, Arizona or, you know, it had been at least four or five years since I'd done Texas, uh, you know, things like that. So, you know, Oklahoma, I haven't done Oklahoma for years. So a lot of times I just kind of go according to where I haven't been for a while, but also places I want to return to, to kind of keep the following intact. And to follow up on that, and some of it with the band thing, the question is, do you always travel with a full band or do you pick up local musicians along the way at times? The majority of the time I travel with my full band. 
Uh, there have been times like last year we did do, me and Anson did a, a tour where we used like three local guys. Uh, the, actually, the tour's coming up. I'm using a piano player that lives in the South, and he's driving up on his own to join us. So, I mean, I know musicians all over. So a lot of times, the way I'll decide is the economics of the tour. So in other words, if, 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 I, ha if I have to fly less people, then that's more money for, say, me and Anson than if, you know, I have to fly everybody. Right. You know. Um, again, following up on that, it seems like you have played and toured with a lot of the same musicians over the years. Yeah. Do you ever bring in new or younger musicians? And second part is, what does it take to be part of Mark Humble's Blues Survivors? If I'm a young guitar player out there and I want to audition well, for you, yeah, that, that's a good question. I mean, for example, last year I did do a thing with somebody I'd never worked with before down south. I think it was a year ago in March that I went down and I played with a guy named Skylar Softly. And I had a bass player named Josh Minucci, who's a really good upright player down in Florida. Uh, I had Clay Swafford, the piano player I was talking about earlier. He was playing piano, and it really kind of came together through Clay because Clay said something like, you know, hey, if you ever want to do gigs down here, I know some guys that could back you up. And the South is notorious for not paying well. The South generally is one of the hardest markets to really get any kind of money out of and to route. It's also a very, very hard area to route because you're looking for weekdays and the money on the weekdays doesn't pay well. So... In that situation, I did get like these guys together for a three-week tour and were able to work Florida dates, uh, deep south dates in, in Mississippi and Alabama and, and Georgia. Uh, I can't remember if we did any Louisiana dates, but we definitely did, you know, that, that neck of the woods. So in a situation like that, it worked out great because, you know, everybody was, uh, everybody was really, uh, you know, a great player. And I did a little bit of rehearsing, and it worked out fine. So it really just depends on where I'm going, you know, the time of the year. There's just a lot of things that come into it. There, there's been a lot of stories over years of musicians being in a club, and somebody walks up and meets them, and they get invited on stage. Have you ever met any oh, that kind of happens, local musicians? That happens all the time. Like, hey, this guy is... Yeah, Incredible. happens all the time. And to be honest with you, the, the, it seems to be sort of a wave of the future that a lot of musicians are starting to travel less and less with bands from where they live because it's such a long way from California all the way out to the East Coast. That's, you know, you're talking 3,000 3, miles and it's much easier to take a flight than drive a van out 3,000 miles. And I've done so much van work that to be honest with you, doing cross country is not something that I'm really that keen on doing anymore, the cross country drives. So we are doing it this time, but you know, like the next the three tours after that or not, you know, we're flying in and we're renting a van or borrowing a van, renting equipment, borrowing equipment. Uh, so, you know, I mean, it, it, there's just a lot of, there's a lot of different things that come into it. I love working with certain musicians that I've been working with for years. I mean, somebody like Wes Starr, we go back, you know, 14 years now of working together. Or Anson goes back 12 years. Um, you know, somebody like uh, uh, Randy Bermudez on bass or, or Kadar Roy. Those are guys I've known for years as well. June Core on drums. You know, we all go way back. There's, you know, Bob Welsh. All these guys go back, you know, 20-something years each or longer. And are these guys your first call? When you're they're kind of my first call, guys. Yeah, yeah, because yeah, they're so good and they're so, you know, they're so uh, uh, aware of my repertoire. Uh, but, you know, I mean, the, the flip side is these are very popular musicians and they play with a lot of really popular names. You know, people like Charlie Muscle White or... Elvin Bishop or the Fabulous Thunderbirds. I mean, you know, th that's going to be a lot of times their first call gigs because they pay well. Right. Mine right. pay okay, but they don't quite yeah. pay what those guys. Um, 
Yeah, the, have to offer. There's even a question down the line about that a little bit, but here's yeah. one of how has touring and the business of touring changed since you first started? Yeah, it's a dramatic difference, uh, touring. Um, when I first started touring, I started touring in 1984. And when I toured, you could literally have a cassette tape and send it to a nightclub and they would hire you. So those days are long gone. Mm -hmm. uh, now you have to have, you know, uh, poll star reports of what your numbers are. You have to have publicity. You have to have a record company. You have to have, you know, uh, a, a, a presence on YouTube. There's so many things that are necessary now to really tour. And so, you know, I, I'd say the biggest thing is that, that, you know, nowadays you have to have what they call a presence media-wise. And so I've had a publicist for, you know, over probably 18 years now that works a lot of my stuff. I've had a record company now for over 20 years that I've worked with. Uh, you know, I've got, uh, people know that they're going to get a certain quality band when I come in mm -hmm. and tell. Mm -hmm. And I have established that. And, and there's no venue owner that you can talk to that could say, well, Mark Hummel really brought in a stinker this last time. Right, right. It just doesn't happen. And that might dovetail into why you tend to work with these same guys. Because yeah, you know absolutely. what you're going to get every absolutely. night. And that translates into your show being better and the promoter is happier. Yeah. And Absolutely. It's, it's like a, a risk aversion thing. You can't really afford right. to take somebody you didn't know. No, I can't really take somebody that I don't know anything about or, or can't attest to what kind of talent they have. I mean, I'm not saying I haven't worked with guys. I mean, over the last few years, I've worked with some, especially on the East Coast, I've worked with uh, some musicians and upright bass player. Mike Law did a tour with me and Rusty Zinn back in 2022. Uh, you know, him and a, a drummer, Nick Toscano, who played on this tour last summer. Uh, they were both excellent. They're excellent musicians. They tour with a lot of people back east. Uh, this time we're taking out a, an East Coast bass player in, in April. Uh, Ted Bukowski, who played on the tour that we, me and Anson did last summer on the East Coast States. So, you know, I mean, a lot of times if I know somebody is really a solid player, I have no problem taking them out. It's just, I have to kind of bear in mind, like for example, I'm doing a new album release coming up and that's gonna be out in say June. And I wanna have guys that were like on the album is, right. is my, you know, one of the things I'd like to concentrate on. There's some questions about recording coming up. Well, uh, um, now what about blues audiences? How have audiences changed? Well, unfortunately, the audiences haven't gotten younger. It's kind of the same audience that I started with, and I'm not saying it's unfortunate. I feel very fortunate to have people that come and see me after all these years. That's a wonderful thing, but I haven't seen it get passed down to a younger audience. And, and the sad part is I see that even to the extent of that a lot of the younger blues musicians that are around they're still getting my audience. Oh. And that's kind of like, that's kind of a strange thing that they haven't attracted a younger audience. So, I mean, I see all kinds of younger musicians like Skylar Softly or, or uh, uh, you know, Clay Swafford, those guys, you know, they're playing to the same people I play for. So do you think it's people at least 20, 30 years older. So this generation, and I'm that generation, mm -hmm. As we fade off into the sunset, and I don't mean die, I mean just get to the point where we don't go out on clubs anymore. Right. What are these young people going to do? Well, that's is, what's is that's what's kind of die? that's what's kind of a scary thing is that you want people to come along that are going to support the music, and you have musicians that have come along, and they support it to a certain degree, but a general mass audience has not been the case. Right. And, and maybe there's people that I don't know about, like maybe Joe Bonamassa has a young audience, maybe uh, uh, Nick Moss has a younger audience, I'm not sure, but I just know for the younger musicians that I've seen play, I haven't seen 
uh, that many young people coming to our shows. So the level, maybe the, the theater and the, the outdoor venues, those acts are doing okay, but the club acts are going to struggle, do you think? Well, I think, uh, I think club acts in general struggle because, you know, you're talking about having to work seven nights a week. And it's a lot harder to get somebody in their 60s or 70s out to a gig, you know, in, on a Wednesday or Tuesday night than it is a young person. Because young people have a, less obligations. They're not as, you know, they're not as beat when they get home from work or whatever. So, you know, I mean, I know when I was young, I went out every night of the week. And now that I'm older, I don't. So, it, you know, I just saw recently where young people now are changing the demographic because they're all going to bed at nine o'clock. Right. They would rather get up early and have this day. Right. Our generation was. We were late we nighters. leave the house until right. nine o'clock. That's right. So is at, that changing clubs? Well, what I've noticed in clubs, yes, is there's a six and seven o'clock start time that's becoming more and more uh, normal. Not like the nine and ten o'clock. Right. Old no, days. I mean, yeah. almost nobody's doing that. Okay. Very few venues are doing a 9 or 10 o'clock start anymore. Wow. wow. And that was the norm. When yeah. I started, man, that was the norm. Oh, back in the day when I yeah. went to the Keystone and Berkeley, yeah. the opening act, the, the main, just yeah. about till midnight. Right. Yeah. That was the norm. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, things have really changed, you know, over the, you know, 40-something years I've been doing mm -hmm. this. Um, you mentioned a little bit about YouTube. What What's social media's impact been on Blues and, and touring. And I think social media has been huge in terms of keeping blues in, uh, visible. Um, I mean, if you go to YouTube, you see, you can find almost anything on YouTube what relates to blues. There's occasional ones that are hard to find, but for the most part, I mean, I have some very rare recordings, and I was actually able to find them on YouTube, you know, Mm -hmm. A couple of years after I got them, mm -hmm. so that that's saying something. Um, now to a little bit more of the players and the business side of touring. If I'm a young musician and I don't have any touring experience, but I'm fantastic, and Mark Hummel hires me to come on a tour, do I get paid per gig, per week, per tour? How do you? How does that business? How do I, as a freelance musician, be able to um, make my living? How well, I mean, I don't know how you're going to make your living touring I mean, these you, days. But are, but are you paying me per gig, per oh, week? Per... I, usually what I do is I come up with a budget because I have to put all the, all the, um, you know, the, the expenses I have to outline first. What's it going to take if I have to rent a van? What's it going to take to fly? What's it going to take... To, if I have to rent equipment, what's it's going to take to rent hotel rooms, uh, the price of gas. You know, I have to put all these things in the hopper, and then after I've done that and figured out what that's going to cost, then I can figure out what I'm paying people. But it, it really varies. I mean, you know, my, my rule of thumb is that I want to pay people anything from, you know, a bill 50 to, you know, to 500 a night or whatever, mm -hmm. you know, depending on who it is you're talking about, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. For, you know, bigger names, you know, hopefully a thousand a night. But it just varies, mm -hmm. you know. And um, generally what I, what I usually come up with is when I'm paying somebody for an entire tour, you're talking a, about a, a, a lot more of a substantial chunk of money than if it was just a few dates. Because right. if you're talking 20, 30 dates, that, you know, that mm -hmm. generates some income and it's a lot more than you're going to make at home. Mm -hmm. If I'm a musician, do are musicians calling you looking for work or are they waiting for a phone call to go on a tour? Is, is anybody sitting around going, hey, Mark, you going to go on a tour? Do you need somebody? I mean, people, as a band leader... People, people, people do that. Show? People do get a hold of me and say, if you ever need, you know, a bass player, you ever need a drummer, you know, give me a call. I mean, people always say that. And I mean, I've always got... Uh, a pretty good backlog of people I can call when I need to. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's that's something I've always kept people's phone numbers. If somebody, you know, that I like, you know, who's playing I like, I will hang on to their phone number, and if if it comes down to it, I'll call them. Do you ever, when you're on a long tour, 
Do you have to have backup plan? Do you know musicians in that area just in case? Generally, I do. Sick? Yeah, generally I do. I remember one time, uh, you know, uh, uh, I think it was one of R. W. Grigsby's relatives died, and he had to step out, and I got a friend of mine that lives in you know Pennsylvania to step in and do the gig. So it happens. Yeah. It does happen. I mean, I remember years ago I was playing when I was playing with Sue Foley's band and her bass player who's still with her, John Penner, his brother was killed in an accident and we had to do the gigs without a bass player wow. for a couple nights. Yeah. And because we had two guitars and a drummer, we could because we all knew how to play that mm -hmm. style. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, you got to you got to kind of have backup plans when it comes right down to it. I mean, that was one reason I learned to play some guitar, you know. If if it came down to it and I lost a whole band, I could do a, some solo numbers. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, those are the kind of things you want to be able to do just in case. And when you've gone to Europe, sometimes you've gone to Europe by yourself. Occasionally. And do you know who you're going to play with when you get there, or is it all going to be a surprise? Uh, no, I always make sure I know who I'm going to play with. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was in the UK a year ago, and I used English musicians there. And I had people that were already, you know, known to me through some of my friends over there. For example, my friend Steve Weston, who's a harp player, uh, you know, told me, hey, I've got a great drummer and a great bass player that I play with. You ought to think about using them. And then somebody else told me about a guitar player, this guy, Lewis Fielding. And, you know, they turned me on to him. So, you know, like a promoter was trying to put together people for me, and I just said, no, right. I want to pick my musicians. People you trust. Yes. Their recommendation. Yeah, I wanted yeah. to trust, and I'm glad I did. Yeah. Because you never know what you're going to come up with. I used to do tours a long time ago with, like, some Italian musicians, and, I, and I'd end up in kind of hot water sometimes. Mm. This was years ago. Hot water musically? Yeah, or? musically, yeah. just not up to par. Right. Yeah. And that reflects on you. And it does. It yeah. definitely reflects right. on you. I remember one time going to Hong Kong. I did a gig in Hong Kong one time, and I ended up playing with this band. It was this real mishmash of players. And it was like, you know, I tried to pick the simplest songs I could, and the guy from the newspaper came down the first night and reviewed it, and he goes, I guess Hummel didn't realize he didn't have his own blues survivors <laughs> with him or something like that because, you know, I didn't I didn't think I was very visibly upset, but I must have it must have come across that right. some of the people weren't yeah, really following. Just your body things. language. My body language to, was, yeah. Yeah, you can you know, you're not Van Morrison, you're not just gonna turn your back on I'm not gonna turn my back and <laughs> scream at him, no. Scream at him. No. Any recent stories where things have just gone horribly bad on the road? Oh, I've had plenty, and they're all in my book. <laughs> oh, okay, and, and your book, we'll put your book up on screen. Yeah, yeah. Okay. No, my book, Big Road Blues, 12 Bars on I-80, that's filled with, you know, 36 years of, of uh, you know, crazy stuff happening. And, I mean, crazy stuff's going to happen on the road. That's one thing I thought about fairly recently. I was thinking to myself, you know, because, I mean, I'm in a position where, now, sometimes I drive out, and I used to have my buddy R.W. driving back with me, and now i got to find somebody that's going to drive back with me. If, if in the middle of the country some of the guys fly home, mm -hmm. you got to have somebody there that's going to help you drive mm -hmm. all the way, the 1,500 miles back home. Right, and that's a long 1,500. And that's a long way, man. That's a long thing to do all by yourself or even with one other person. Mm -hmm. And me and R.W. got real used to doing that, but we ended up in some kind of hairy situations. I remember one time we had to sleep in the van because we couldn't find a hotel room for like, you know, 800 miles. Yeah, wow. And we tried every single hotel, and there was some huge, like, you know, construction convention that came into Montana that year, or Wyoming that year, or that month, and it was like there was all this building going on, so all these construction workers were were taking up the hotels. Huh. Yeah, so we ended up literally sleeping for like three or four hours outside of a flying J, you know, in the middle of the night. Yeah. Stuff happens, man. Yeah. You, you really don't know what you're going to get into. Or, or breakdowns, that's another one. You know, you can have a breakdown anywhere, 
end up in a little town and, and not be able to find a good mechanic. So there's there's a lot of hairy stuff that can come your way. Well, I was thinking about that as I was looking at your lineup for your tour coming up in the yeah. southwest and the south. Yeah. You are night after night after night yeah. with what seems like all one nighters miles yep. in between. All one nighters. And it's just a leap of faith that there's mm -hmm. gonna be no built in like, that your van's gonna that make your it. Your van's gonna make it. That's right, and because then somebody's I mean somebody's gonna not sh you know, they're gonna disappear on you or something. Right. Well I've had crazy stuff like that happen. Another thing I remember one time with Sue Foley was the drummer disappearing. You know, he just jumped out of the van on, at, after a gig and just disappeared. And we didn't know if he was going to show up the next night. And I started calling up, like you're saying, calling up people I knew in Memphis that might be able to do the gig if he didn't show. Mm. And fortunately, he showed up. But I'm just saying, you don't know. Right. You never know. Right. And so there's a, there is a lot of leap leaps of faith when it comes to going out on the road. Yeah, uh, looking at this last yeah. tour, I'm like, I don't know how you can get from here to there. Yeah. And then I think there's one gig, you're doing like two shows in We're a day. We're doing two shows in a day. And then you are traveling seemingly hundreds and hundreds of miles. Yeah, well, we're traveling day. probably 500 miles the next day. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And that's exhausting all in itself. It is. And it's like, I mean, you know, I'm 68 years old and it was like, you know, in 2016, I had a heart attack not long after a tour like that mm -hmm. where me and R.W. had driven 1,500 miles, you know. Yeah. And I'd say 10 days later, I had a heart attack. Yeah. Because, you know, I mean, it's exhausting. It really is. I mean, being behind the wheel for three or four weeks at a time is exhausting. It's not an easy thing to do. And, um, you know, I have to say, I mean... You know, things get easier the longer you do it in the sense of that you you become more prepared for what's out there. Right. And, uh, you know, so when we had like a transmission go out uh, before the first date in Portland, we're in Portland, Oregon, we drive into town and literally the transmission took a dump right on the highway. And I had to get towed to our hotel. I had to find somehow a transmission shop to put a new transmission in and try doing that. Right. You know, when you got a week before you have to come back, try putting in a new transmission, finding a place that will do it because almost all of them will say, no, we're three, three weeks out. Mm -hmm. And lucky for me, I found somebody that would do it and I rented a van. We started the rest of the tour in the rental van. We did a week out on the road with the rental van, came back, the van was ready and we drove it home. Right. But it messes up your entire business model. Right? Well, yes, it does. It yeah. does. So, I mean, you know, something like my expense of a new engine in this van, I just look at it like, well, that came out of my last tour, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and it's a tax write-off. So, you know, I mean, you just have to kind of look at it like that. I mean, fortunately, I've done well enough that I've got reserve. I don't have like some kind of bank account with nothing in it. I mean, if I was like that, it would really be hairy. And I, you know, I read this book by William Clark where, you know, uh, or not by William Clark, about William Clark, where the guy talked about, and I remember playing with a lot of his musicians, William Clark's old musicians, and I would play with them and they'd tell me these horror stories about him going out on ball tires on tours. And, you know, sometimes like a radiator that wasn't working properly and you're just asking for trouble mm -hmm. when that happens. Mm -hmm. So I made a deal with myself that I was never going to go out with a vehicle that was not in good running condition mm -hmm. because it's not worth it. No, you have, uh, yeah. There's too many variables getting from gig to gig. Right. Mm -hmm. So those are things I learned early on. I mean, you know, and I, I mean, I think about how many vans I've been through. I've been probably through 10 or 12 vans. Wow. Wow. You know. So if you were starting out in blues today, what do you think would be your path? How would you get to work? A real you job? Want? A real job? <laughs> no, I, I can't really say that. I mean, you know, when I when I started doing this, I really, I had a very ambitious kind of drive to get somewhere in this, in the blues business and get somewhere with blues harmonica. And uh, fortunately for me, 
I kind of prepared myself for the pitfalls that it was going to have. So I lived very economically, you know. I mean, I was on food stamps, you know, at the beginning, and, and I ate a lot of rice and beans. And, and I just, you know, I, I really kind of lived very frugally. I lived in this one little basement apartment in Berkeley, and, and my rent was like 90 bucks, and then it went up to 120, and there was rent control back in those, those days. So I could kind of get away with stuff. But, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I really, I never dreamed of the big time because I figured in blues, it really wasn't a realistic thing to dream about. And I was right. Mm -hmm. I mean, the blues is a very tiny little percentage of the music business. Right. And it's very unpopular uh, compared to, you know, commercial music like pop or rock or or, you know, uh, classic, uh, you know, ballads, things like that. I mean, blues is just, it's really kind of a thing. It, it, it grabs you or it doesn't grab you. And for me, I like the fact that a lot of the singers had rough voices or that a lot of the guitar players played less notes or the harmonica players played less notes. I like the economy of the blues. That was really what attracted me to the music. And, and that it was real. That was huge. Mm -hmm. Because it's, it's one of the few musics, musics out there, music out there that really has uh, a sincerity to it. You can't BS your way through it, you know. I mean, you had people in the day like, you know, uh, Little Richard and then you had Pat Boone, you know, um, good golly, Miss Molly, yeah. sure like to ball. You know, you had that. But to me, if someone heard the real guy, like Little Richard, they'd stop listening to him altogether. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's how I was about blues. I mean, once I heard the real blues guys after listening to, you know, Cream and, and, and Blue Cheer and bands like that, I just kind of went, later with that, I'm into these guys. And they weren't near as popular. They did not have that, uh, the appeal with white kids that, that say somebody that looked like them had. So getting into that a little bit, it, it, young African-Americans do not seem to be moving into the blues. If no, I that's not blues, true. That's not true at all. No, young African-Americans are moving into the okay. blues. And it's becoming much more of a thing now because uh, for a long time, I think black people kind of didn't play, claim the blues almost. Like they kind of really felt like it was old people's music. It was kind of like us listening to Frank Sinatra. That's kind of what it was. And uh, so now there's this new generation of, of young African-American kids that are starting to listen to it. And young adults, and and so they're, and and what's really cool is that a lot of them are very into this old traditional sound that I love. So there's this one kid, Harold Davenport. He calls himself Young Rel, 17 years old. He just turned 17. He's phenomenal. And it was like when I started talking to him, I was like, this reminds me of me when I was young, you know. And it was real. It's a really exciting thing when you meet people that are younger that are into the music like that. It, it th it's thrilling. It really is a thrilling thing. So so I, I'm I'm trying to really support. You know, I had Andrew Ali, who's a, a young African American guy from Richmond, Virginia, and I had him on the blowouts this year, and that was. I want to try to have at least one young kid, you know, that's, that's, uh, you know, that's into this kind of music, you know, and there's a number of them. There's John Tavius Willis, and he calls himself Quan Willis. There's uh, Marquise Knox. There's uh, Andrew. There's, uh, um, uh, there's a new kid, Mac McDonald, that's a phenomenal young guitar player. J.K. Harrell, Harrell is another one. Uh, so there's really this kind of new crop of players that's starting to come up, and it's it's a really exciting thing for guys like me and 
and a lot of the you know white guys of my generation that have kind of felt like this was like going by the wayside. Well, this has been quite an education, Mark, and I'm, I'm sure our viewers got their questions answered sufficiently. So I want to thank you for doing that. And don't be this 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 uh, disgruntled if. You know, you don't hear back from me. Right, right yeah. Away. He's on tour and I'm <laughs> yeah, yeah, manning yeah. sometimes the yeah. emails and, and uh, it's it's not always easy to get back. So this was a great opportunity to answer some of these questions yeah. and, and to um, sort of even some of my own curiosities as I'm sitting here editing harmonica party episodes, all these things come to mind and then Yeah, I well I mean I was thinking them. about it the other day when I thought about this tour and I thought, you know, boy, I'm I'm really getting out there doing a tour like this where you're you got your nose to the grindstone every night.